uh, Professor Aditi Butoria from the Public Policy and Management Group. I am Calcutta. I'm also a member of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Today with me are uh, Dr. Shubrangshu Sanyal, who's the CEO of IMC Innovation Park, and Mr. Jaydeep Sendin, who is an MBA second year student, also the president of the ESEL. With us today, and we are highly elated to welcome actually Mr. Suman Sinha, who is the chairman and CEO of Renew Power, India's largest clean energy company. Renew Power is a NASDAQ listed company that was founded in January 2011, starting with a small wind project in Gujarat with a vision to transform the way energy is produced and consumed in India. Since then, the new power has grown significantly to become India's largest renewable power producer, spanning more than 100 sites across the country. So Mr. Sinha is a passionate advocate for solutions related to climate change um, through the intersection of business and public policy, which is extremely interesting. He has spoken extensively at Global Fora, whether it's a World Economic Forum at Davos or uh, forums organized by the Financial Times, Goldman Sachs, and you name it. He is also, um, you know, uh, he has and is holding several positions. So UN Global Compact's SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal Pioneer 2021 for contribution towards accelerating clean energy. Uh, he's also co-chair of the Electricity Governors Group, member of the Stewardship Board on Shaping the Future of Energy at the World Economic Forum, uh, chair of the Climate Group India's Advisory Board, so on and so forth. The list goes on. Um, more importantly, he's on the Board of Governors of Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, IIT Delhi, and also I am Calcutta. He's an alumni of the Institute. And it's our absolute pleasure to welcome him and hear from him today. Well, welcome, Mr. Sana. How are you doing today? I'm good, uh, Aditi. Thank you so much for uh, having a chat with me today. It's, it's completely our pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I think um, I would like to start with one of the most basic questions. Probably you've been asked this several times mm -hmm. given your journey. But how was your foray into entrepreneurship? You know, um, how did that journey happen and what was your motivation and vision to start Renew Power and venture into the renewable energy domain? That's a very long story uh, because I started as an entrepreneur quite late in life. And so it took a long while for me to get to that point. Uh, but uh, let me take a step back and, and try to uh, talk about my journey and how I came to that point back in 2010 where I felt the need to do something different. Um, so, you know, after I finished I'm Calcutta, I got a job uh, in India. Then I decided to go overseas, came, you know, worked in investment banking for many years. But I always had the desire to come back to India. And so in 2002, I got an opportunity to um, head finance in the other Tabela group. Um, and so I came back for that opportunity. And while I was there, I was there for about six years. Uh, you know, at some level, I would say by that time, I already had the desire to do something uh, a little bit different and to do something where I was a little bit more in control or, uh, you know, master of what I was trying to do. Um, and so therefore, starting something on my own was something that was al always something that was in my mind. Now, uh, in 2008, uh, actually end of 2007, I randomly got contacted by uh, Stu's Law. Now, Susan at that time was one of the world's largest wind turbine manufacturing companies and a uh, homegrown uh, entity uh, doing very well at that, you know, at that point in time. And so when I looked at it, I thought that here is a company that is operating in a very interesting space. And it appeared to me even back 15 years ago that uh, climate change would become a more important issue going forward. And so when I looked at... Uh, whether it made sense for me to make that career shift into climate change. And as I looked at the future of the whole issue of climate change, I felt that it was an area that would in fact become much more fundamental uh, to humanity in the future. And so I said, you know, it's probably a good place to get in to a new sector early. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about what it required to, uh, to start something on your own. Uh, and, and the conclusion I came to was that you either needed to be a technology type person uh, who had some understanding of a specific technology uh, or who um, um, uh, basically uh, had a great idea 
and was willing to take risk to support that idea. Um, but fundamentally, you needed to have something differentiated about you. And through my life, I've been, I've been a finance person. Uh, as a finance person, it's very hard to really have something that really differentiates you from everybody else. Uh, so climate change seemed to be something where I could actually develop a career for myself and you know could develop that differentiated knowledge over time. And so that's why I left the Birla Group and joined Suzlon. But as I joined Suzlon in August of 2008, uh, the financial crisis hit uh, almost immediately within a month of my joining Suzlon. And as I discovered then, and as I'm discovering now, uh, clean energy stocks globally uh, are very liquidity driven. And so when in fact the Fed, you know, the entire financial crisis happened, um, a lot of clean tech stocks were, you know, were very exposed at that time, including Suzlon. So I spent two years there, you know, trying to really solve a lot of the fundamental problems of the company as best as I could. Uh, but, you know, uh, and that was a painful enough uh, experience, but I learned a lot in doing that. I learned a lot about what can go wrong in companies when they grow too fast uh, or when they take too much risk or when they get too leveraged or when they don't invest in uh, necessarily in building the organization's capabilities. So I learned a tremendous amount uh, in, that, in that role. Uh, but, and I also learned very importantly the sector. And so then somewhere around 2010, I was confronted then with the choice of either staying at Suzlon and continue to deal with all the problems that were there. Or essentially, I could also see that one step downstream of Suzlon, uh, you know, Suzlon was selling wind turbines, but the Indian government at that time was making certain policy changes, which essentially meant that there was a business model emerging for companies one step downstream of Suzlon, which essentially would be buyers of these wind turbines and essentially sellers of the power that was generated from these wind turbines. Now, this was an asset intensive business because you had to actually buy these turbines and each megawatt of turbine cost a million dollars. Um, but it seemed like it was an emerging opportunity. And while I was at Suzlon, I could see a, you know, a bunch of new people who had no real background in the sector going off and starting off in this area. And I realized that if my thesis of becoming an entrepreneur meant that you had to start something early, then it was early, but it was going to get late very soon also. So I realized that I would have to do something fast. So therefore, I, I said, you know what, this is a new sector that I understand now reasonably well. I'm not just a finance person. I have an operating background as well. Um, I, uh, this is a new sector where there are new business models emerging. And therefore, I felt at least in terms of the newness of this sector and the newness of the opportunity, I had what it took. But I did not have two other fundamental factors. One is risk-taking ability, okay? Because as an entrepreneur, you just have to let go and you have to jump off. And that's not an easy thing to do when you have the kind of education that a lot of us who went to the IMs do because we have safe and secure jobs. Jadeep will have that same problem uh, at some point in the future. When you have a job in a good organization, you really just leave that and, you know, jump off and, you know, take that risk. That's, so it's a tough decision, especially for somebody like me who was already in my early 40s at that time. Uh, so that's one issue I had to overcome. And the second issue obviously was that I did not have any capital of my own. I did not come from a wealthy family or come from a promoter family or anything. And this was a capital intensive business. But what I, so this is really where my second thesis came into play, which was that I felt I had what it took in terms of background. I had financial knowledge. I had a lot of contacts in the financial industry. And I also, by that time, began to realize that if you had a good idea, there were a lot of people out there who were willing to fund you. And so therefore I said, you know, if I put all of these different things together, the only thing really missing the catalyst is my ability to just leave, jump off the cliff and take the risk, right? And that's what I did then. I pushed myself into taking that risk. And in 2010, I left my job at Suzlon and I started exploring how to set this whole thing up. But it required a lot of internal push because it's not something that, you know, nobody is telling me to do it. If anything, your family tells you, don't take risk. Why are you doing this, uh, et cetera. You're jumping into something that is not clear. It is, uh, you know, at a very early stage. Therefore, you don't know how it's going to evolve in the future. So there are lots of uncertainties. And, uh, uh, and so, so really that's how it happened. Uh, but I would say that somewhere deep inside, I had the desire to do something different. I had been looking for the kinds of, you know, how to construct an opportunity like this without being somebody who was a technologist and therefore had 
or a, or a software guy. Um, and I was mid-stage in my career already by that time. And so therefore, there were a lot of specific things in my context that required me to think about it very deliberately and then only take the decision. But that's what I did. That's how it came to pass. Fantastic. This sounds extremely inspiring, to be very honest. Uh, and I think Suzlon itself now has a journey of more than 10 years, you know, and uh, in this journey, as you said, there would be uncertainty, there would be risk, and you would have had to make choices, you know. Um, question is, um, what do you think worked for you and what did not? What were some of the learnings that you could share with the audience here, and especially the students who are looking at you with a lot of aspiration? Uh, you know, there is one aspect, which is your life's journey. Um, and there are obviously certain things that I learned along that. And the second thing is the journey that I've had at Renew for the last 10 years and what has worked specifically. So would you like me to address both or one or the other? I think more so for your journey with Renew, okay. uh, because a little bit of your life journey you did cover earlier and we would come yeah. back to it. But um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's fine. So look, as far as my uh, experience at Renew is concerned, so, you know, when I started the company, frankly, I had very modest aspirations, like any startup entrepreneur. Uh, in the beginning, you know, it was a question of, uh, and, and frankly, you know, I didn't come from a business background. Uh, I, you know, I had not, nobody taught me how you do these things, right? This is all, you have to just touchy-feely your way through it. Uh, and there's no written playbook that you can follow. And that's really one of the joys of being an entrepreneur and doing something on your own. But it's also one of the issues that you have to solve. You have to have that intrinsic inherent capability of dealing with very highly ambiguous situations and not getting faced by them and slowly, slowly one step at a time solving the problems, right? So in the beginning, it is all about how do you survive? Uh, and, you know, in the, uh, in the first year or so, I built a pipeline of projects using my own money. So one thing I realized is the value of money. Okay, as working for a large corporate, you just don't understand, you know, you're happy to travel business class because you're entitled to it. But then you realize that, you know, traveling Delhi, Bombay, 40,000 rupees, 50,000 rupees versus Indigo, which at that time was 5,000 rupees and it's your own money. You start wondering, why the hell am I paying 35,000 rupees extra, <laughs> right? So I think it's sim those kinds of very simple things that you begin to realize about life. And you realize that it is just equally uh, easy to do things in a very different way. But Essentially, uh, so that's one realization that I had at that point, right? The second thing I um, uh, did was I built this pipeline, hired a few people, um, and, uh, and then I went looking for funding. And uh, the, the first problem that I came across was the fact that, uh, you know, I was looking for about, to raise about 50 or $60 million, because as I said, our business was capital intensive. So I had built a pipeline of about 150 megawatts. And to fund that from an equity standpoint, I needed that much money. Uh, so when I went to the uh, private equity guys, they said, you know, Suman, we, we, the, everything is fine. You know, we like you. Uh, we may or may not like the business. You know, some liked it, some didn't like it. But they, they said, frankly, you know, you don't actually have a single rupee of revenue uh, and you have no business at this point. So how can we just give you such a large amount of money, right? You should go to the venture guys. So I went to the venture guys and I said, venture guys, I need $50 million. And this, they fell off the chair and they said, well, you know, what are you smoking? The fact is we start with $500,000 and then maybe if we like you, we'll increase it by another million dollars. And, you know, you do series A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and then maybe you'll get somewhere in life, right? But $50 million, forget it. So I realized that I was falling between these two different stools with the, with the, with the business uh, that we had in the ask that I had. And uh, there was no easy way of getting around it, unfortunately. So I knocked on many, many doors and, you know, this is really where my background of having been in finance in Bombay helped. I knew a lot of people, but I knocked on a lot of doors. And, you know, one of those doors that I knocked on was that of Goldman Sachs. Now, Goldman had invested in a startup platform in wind in the U.S. earlier and had successfully scaled up that platform and sold it. And they'd made a lot of value for themselves. So and they were looking to restart their investing business in India. They had a business, but it hadn't done that well. So they were looking to under new management restarted. And so they had come to the conclusion that they wanted to invest in infrastructure within that power, within that renewables, within that they said, you know what, let's go for a startup platform and, and you know, then help scale it up. And they'd come to all of this conclusion by themselves. And that's when I knocked on their door. Okay, so it was just one of those very 
fortunate coincidences that happen. Um, but two, three things behind it. Number one was that I wasn't the only person who knocked on their door. Because unbeknownst to me, even though I thought I was starting this business early, there were at least another 20 people who had the, who'd had the same idea. Some very smart people. And they were also all knocking on various doors. And so there were at least four or five other people who also knocked on Goldman's doors. So the first thing was I had to knock. Nobody is asking me to go there and knock at their door, but I did, right? And so you have to pound the pavement, which is my other learning that you do have to pound the pavement a lot. The second thing was that when Goldman went through their evaluation process, you know, and they looked at the various opportunities in front of them, they said, look, here is a person who has been there quite a lot. He's worked in large corporate corporations. He's worked in the finance area. Um, uh, and um, he's also worked in the sector and therefore understands the sector. So he's not just somebody who's coming here trying to you know, create something where he doesn't really understand anything. And so that's why they finally zeroed in on me. And, uh, and that's how the whole investment happened. Okay, but it happened very quickly. It took three, four months for them to get that approval, but it happened very quickly. So in the beginning, it was all about just basic survival for me and raising the first slug of capital. But once that happened, then we were off and running. So then a whole different series of issues started off. Uh, so it, was, it became a question of moving from capital raising and basic survival, because if that investment hadn't happened, I would have had to bind everything up, tell all my people, for the five, six people that I had, sorry guys, it didn't work out, uh, go and find something else and write off whatever little capital that I had invested on my own and go and find something else to do with my life. It was really at that level. So I crossed that hump. And that's really when a lot of other different kinds of learning started, really. So the, one of the first things that I was confronted with was the, the kind of business that I was trying to create. Okay, keep in mind that our, our, we, are, we operate in the infrastructure sector in India. And, you know, that has a certain style of operating, at least had at that point in time. People operated in a certain manner. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of how people operate, but I think most people will understand. And so very early in my evolution as a company, I was confronted with the kind of company that I wanted to create. And when I thought about it, I realized that for me, the means were as important as the ends. And I didn't want to just get it somewhere, somehow or the other. I wanted to get there in the right way by doing things ethically, fairly, and with a high degree of integrity. And a lot of people, when I told them this, said, you know, you must be crazy for thinking like this because this is India, this is infrastructure. Nobody operates in this manner. But frankly, it just didn't gel with my value systems to do anything differently. And so therefore I said, you know what, I, you know, that's my upbringing and I can't, I, even if I wanted to, I could not operate in that way. So I, therefore I took a very early decision to do things as cleanly uh, uh, as possible. So that was one learning that I had. And the thing is, while I took that decision early for the, you know, for reasons that were intrinsic to me, I realized later in life, five, seven, 10 years later, it created a reputation for our company. And that reputation then allowed us to raise more capital much more easily because people realized that we had good governance, we were an ethical company, and they were comfortable therefore doing business with us, right? And therefore that is something that became an advantage over a period of time. Not that I deliberately set out for it to be an advantage, but it did become an advantage. And even today, I think if you talk to most people, uh, they'll tell you that, you know, our company has a good reputation in terms of how we come across, not just on issues of ethics and integrity, but also how we come across as a partner, as a vendor, as a supplier, uh, as an employer, you know, in all of those ways, it you know, sort of permeates our, our uh, thinking and our culture. So that is one. The second thing is that um, um, I also realized that uh, building the organization was as critical as building the business. And that's something that I find most entrepreneurs tend to not focus on. And uh, because everybody gets very focused on building their business. But in my years of having, you know, been in senior positions in large organizations and seeing the kind of policies and procedures that they have, it gave me a sense of what to shoot for as an organization and what kind of internal systems and processes to have. Um, and it's not just a question of hiring people. It's a question of how those people interface with each other, the value systems that they have, uh, the, the processes that you create behind them. So, and the thing is that if you want your business to be growing rapidly, then your organization has to be at least two or three years ahead of where your business is. Otherwise, you'll never have the capacity to scale your business up. 
and you'll just keep stretching the rubber band of your organization more and more and more. And then one day it will just snap or you will snap. And a lot of people delude themselves by thinking that, oh, look, I'm working so hard. I'm working so hard. I'm working so hard. But working hard is not the smartest thing in the world. You know, instead of you're working 24 seven and saying, oh my God, I'm doing so much. It's much better for you to spend that time earlier to hire the right people and get them to do a lot of the work for you, which also therefore means that your role as an entrepreneur keeps changing over the years. It's not static. In the beginning, you are the risk taker. You, you, know, you get people hired, you have a vision and so on. But then over time, and by the way, you do everything yourself because it's a small organization. You're deeply involved in whatever you're doing. But then over time, you, your organization becomes bigger. You hire more people. Then you become a manager of people. Then you're not doing things yourself then you have to know the ability of how to get things to be done by other people in the same kind of way. Maybe there's some loss of effectiveness, but you have to figure out how to manage around that. Um, and then, you know, now our organization has about 2000 people and we have more than 130 sites across India, you know, many different offices and different parts of the country. In the beginning, I used to go to our sites a lot. Now I hardly go to our sites because they're hard to get to, right? So my role has changed as well. And it's not just that my role has changed. You know, the people who reported to me have had to change their roles also. Because if they had not changed their roles, I would not have been able to change my role. Because, you know, if I scale up and they don't scale up, then the gap would just get created. So I've had to get them to also scale themselves up. Now, not everybody is able to scale up. And so you have the you know, horrible task of figuring out who is going to make that, that journey with you and for how long. And who will not make that journey? And some people are not able to. And that's really heartbreaking because these are people that have been on the journey with you. They've gone through thick and thin with you. And, you know, they're your friends. So, but again, for the sake of the organization, you have to take some of those decisions. So look like this, I can just go on and on and on because there are lots and lots and lots of things that I've learned along the journey. But let me stop here and sort of hand it back to you. Arthi. I think these are fantastic lessons in organization building, to be very honest, you know, trusting your own value system, developing an organization, getting the people along with you, great lessons out there. Um, so your company's growth generally has sort of mirrored the sector's growth, which also something you alluded to. How do you think that has happened over the years? And then after this, I would move on to Shubhrangshu to make him ask you more uh, futuristic questions. Okay, sure. So yeah, look, our sector has grown quite dramatically, of course. Back in 2011, it was a niche sector. Uh, I must say the Indian government, uh, various governments have been very proactive about encouraging the sector. So even back then, there were certain policy uh, you know, measures that they had that allowed us to grow. But frankly, at that time, renewables was a bit of a niche sector. It was a small, very small part of the overall power sector. And uh, there were very big thermal power players and they sort of, you know, condescended uh, towards us. And frankly, they were not, uh, you know, they just felt that, you know, we were not worth bothering with, thankfully, by the way, for us. And, um, and renewables was certainly solar was a lot more expensive. Wind was a tad more expensive than thermal power. Um, and so it needed certain elements of support from the government to make it uh, grow. Um, and till about 2017 or 18, I would say that is the system that persisted. Um, but then somewhere around 2000, and, uh, first of all, in 2014, when this government came in, Prime Minister Modi set some very, very ambitious targets for renewable energy and full marks to him for that, because it was against uh, whatever recommendations of the policy establishment, establishment were there. He, so Moto set a very high target and really pushed forward on uh, growing uh, renewable substantially. And uh, then uh, around 2018, 19, renewables suddenly became cheaper because technology kept evolving. And as it became cheaper, then over the next two, three years after that, we've now got to a point where the pressure of climate change has increased dramatically. The cost of renewables has become much cheaper than anything else. And now we're in a situation where, as you look at further capacity additions of the power sector, it's really, nobody wants to invest in coal any longer. And therefore any future capacity addition will happen out of renewables. So now renewables is it. Uh, in the power sector, right? So there is no other form of new capacity addition, et cetera. Renewables is the, is the future. And now what's happening is that through the evolution of things like green hydrogen and so on, renewables will also move beyond just the power sector or the electricity sector, which by the way accounts for only about a quarter of the entire energy sector. 
and will move into the broader energy sector itself. And so therefore what's happening is people are now beginning to realize that there is a fundamental energy transition that is at play here. And therefore you will, you're seeing now the, the level of competition changing because a lot of energy companies are now realizing that they have to invest in this sector. And so our whole space, which for the last 10 years, we were sort of able to grow in with only other similar companies to us in it, now is seeing a fundamental change in, uh, in, in uh, you know, how things might evolve from this point on. Fantastic. Uh, Shubhrangshu, would you like to take on now? Yeah, thanks, Aditi. Hi, Suman. Uh, so uh, I work with uh, Innovation Park within Ham Calcutta, where we are uh, supporting startups. Uh, so just for your information, uh, we have now uh, five incubation centers. Obviously, the main one is within the campus. And then uh, along with the state governments, we have set up incubation centers in Guwahati, Shillong, Tura, and Itanagar. So the East and North is focused. So we meet uh, several startups at various stages. Uh, and uh, we, we, uh, what I liked about uh, your experience sharing is that there are many uh, executives who want to leave their job and want to get into startup. Uh, I think your experience of transitioning from a corporate executive to an entrepreneur, there are some fantastic messages. And this recording will immensely help them that, you know, before they take up the plunge, they should be prepared to face whatever you have faced, right? Yeah. So uh, I have uh, two uh, broad questions, uh, which are again from the perspective of a startup. So now uh, the startups are uh, like the youngsters are quite interested in the renewable energy sector and they are uh, coming up with prototypes, solutions for that. But uh, they uh, really lack the uh, uh, vision or insights on where this sector is going to, uh, how this sector is going to grow over the period of last uh, next 10 years. And what are some of, the, what would be some of the key growth divers? Because that will help them to, um, uh, you know, or prepare them well uh, at the very initial stage of their startup journey. So Sumanth, if you can please uh, share your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, sure. So, you know, uh, first of all, it's great. Uh, you know, you guys are doing uh, at the Innovation Park terrific work and we do need Thank to you, spread yeah. the gospel of entrepreneurship across uh, into uh, um, and making it a make it a much more common theme across society. Uh, you know, uh, we have to have a situation where entrepreneurs are in fact uh, fated, not reviled if they don't succeed uh, because, you know, you truly make good entrepreneurs who potentially fail you know, a few times before they actually succeed. And there's a lot of learning uh, in that as well. So I think helping entrepreneurs along this journey is, is, uh, is, a, is a terrific thing that you all are doing. So congratulations to, to you all for that. Um, as far as your question is concerned uh, on renewable energy, um, you know, this is, as I said earlier, a sector that is going to grow dramatically. And uh, in the entire energy space, um, the oil and gas industry, which has been, of course, which continues to be this mammoth industry, the oil and gas industry has been investing globally about six to seven hundred billion dollars every year. Okay, the power sector, the electricity sector, has been investing about three to three hundred fifty billion dollars every year. So combined, they've been doing about a trillion dollars or thereabouts uh, in the entire energy sector globally. Now the expectation is that just in renewable energies. Uh, we need investments of one to one and a half trillion dollars every year for the next several years. And so just the renewable energy industry by itself will be as big, if not bigger, than the entire energy industry, the oil, the oil and gas industry, the power sector put together. <coughs> now, the same kind of scale is going to play out within India as well. If anything, in India, it's going to be an even bigger scale. <coughs> the reason being that India is still, early, is still early in our energy journey and our energy penetration is still very low on a per capita basis. And so a lot of our energy infrastructure still has to be built out. And most of that will now start getting diverted into uh, the clean energy area. Now, what are those clean energy areas? Number one, of course, is that um, in the power sector, you will see only capacity addition happening in renewables now. Renewables, that is wind and solar, is cheaper than nuclear, hydro, coal, 
biomass, everything. Okay, so therefore, a future capacity addition will happen only in this area. And it's not just cheaper; it's substantially cheaper. It's like 30, 40 percent cheaper. Okay, um, so you'll see a lot of uh, new capacity addition happening only in renewables now. Now, have the, the issue with renewables, however, is that it is intermittent power. Uh, it is not base load or firm power. And so the management of the grid will require a tremendous amount of understanding. It will require things like batteries. It will require um, uh, uh, software, much better software. And this will be required across all the distribution utilities of India, which by the way, have a total turnover of close to about a hundred billion dollars. Uh, so we need smart meters. We need people who can do the digital that goes into the smart meters, who can analyze all that data, uh, who can drive consumer behavior because you have demand side situations. You'll have energy efficiency services as well. So you'll have that entire evolution within the electricity area that uh, will have to evolve. Now, for smaller entrepreneurs, for uh, people who don't have that much capital, there will be a lot of uh, new emerging opportunities around some of these areas. Then you'll have the whole thing extended to mobility, electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging stations. So those will have to be deployed. Now, for those uh, and at the retail level, by the way, there'll be a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs because first of all, setting up rooftop solutions uh, for retail customers and industrial customers, that's one solution that has to be implemented at a local level. Number two, charging stations to be set up again has to be implemented at the local level. So all of those kinds of opportunities will also be there. Um, then beyond that, uh, as I said, beyond the electricity sector, um, as renewables moves into things like through green hydrogen into uh, the industrial sector, uh, where wherever hydrogen is used, gray hydrogen is used, etc., uh, there there'll also be the, re the replacement with green hydrogen, and therefore there'll be a full ecosystem that develops with electrolyzers to to um, to create the green hydrogen, to transport the green hydrogen, and again a lot of this can has to be done in situ. It can't be done far away and then transported because transporting gas is not that or hydrogen is not that easy. So you'll have to do it in situ. Then there will be things like wherever gas is used currently, that will get replaced by hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen again. So gas pipelines eventually will move into green hydrogen. So there's going to be a whole replacement of the gas economy with the green hydrogen economy uh, as well over time. Fuel cells out of green hydrogen will also evolve. So there's going to be that whole evolution. And then as you have more and more capacity of renewables getting set up, you need to have people who can actually uh, set up these projects. So you'll have to have EPC capability and you'll need to have O&M capability. So anybody who can train people and provide people into these areas will also be opportunities in the sector. Carbon credits, another big area that will emerge. So there are quite a few areas like that that are going to emerge and become much, much bigger than they are right now. We're at, right now at the very infancy of the sector, actually, in some ways. And so it'll really spread, you know, the opportunities will spread into a bunch of different areas. Thanks, Suman, for sharing your uh, insights. And I think you have uh, answered my next question, which I had planned to ask you that, what are the potential hot opportunities for the aspiring entrepreneurs? And I think you have mentioned some uh, key points, uh, which I think uh, answers the second question also. So let me move directly to the third question. Uh, now, uh, you, uh, you, you, when you were talking about your experience with your startup, so one big challenge you face is that you need a lot of money to spend on the infrastructure. And uh, that was a big challenge, right? Uh, so uh, the startups uh, that we are incubating, uh, working in the renewable energy sector, they are also having the same perception that uh, this is interesting, but uh, you need a lot of uh, initial capital to uh, at least, you know, um, commercialize it and, and then scaling up. And, and that is one of the reasons we see that some very interesting um, work or innovative uh, solutions uh, fail to scale up. I mean, they just get stuck at a certain stage because of the high capital requirement that they have. Uh, so is this scenario changing or uh, what would be your advice to the startups so that they don't get discouraged and they continue to uh, uh, innovate and uh, look forward to commercialization. So this is a big challenge that we are facing as an incubator. So we need your advice. So, so, so Granshu, my view on that may be a little bit controversial or provocative, mm -hmm. but I don't think that there is a deficiency of capital. Okay, mm -hmm. India today has a ton of capital. 
uh, there are people falling over each other to invest in interesting, good quality startups and good quality entrepreneurs. I think the shortfall really, the gap lies in the fact that either the idea is not good enough uh, and therefore just not commercially a sound idea, or if it is, you are not able to convince or reach out to enough capital providers, okay? Or you're not able to communicate the story adequately to them. And that again is a shortfall of the entrepreneur. Now, see, being an entrepreneur is not just a question of having a great idea and then being an execution guy. Being an entrepreneur also means that you have to manage the entire ecosystem around yourself, which also includes capital providers. So being, you know, being able to raise capital is as much being an entrepreneur as, as, as is anything else. So to, you know, so if you're not able to raise capital, I would say that you're failing in your job as an entrepreneur. It's not that you can say, oh, I'm such a great entrepreneur, I have such a great idea, but you're capital email, I can say. So there's must be something wrong with the capital providers. No, I think the capital providers are there. They want to invest in opportunities, right? There's so many of them right now. So I would say you need to think a little bit more deeply about your business model. You need to think a little bit more deeply about how to communicate that to people, uh, potential investors. And you need to do a lot more effort or put in a lot of lot more work on actually reaching out to investors and communicating your story to them. And if you can do that, then there is no dearth of capital at this point in time. I would say that, for example, uh, and Bhavi, there are enough VCs also out there who are investing in this sector. There are enough angel investors like us who are also willing to uh, back uh, new startups and so on. So I would say that there is no uh, reason that somebody who has a great idea today uh, should not be able to raise capital. And uh, Suvant, I agree. Uh, this is what uh, investors are also sharing with us, the same message that you, know, you need a fundable idea uh, and we are willing to fund. Uh, I think th there is another uh, opportunity that uh, uh, we see is um, uh, the corporates are also now coming forward and willing to collaborate with startups. Uh, and, uh, and the startups uh, can pilot their solution even you know, uh, they get uh, uh, the initial even funding support from corporate. So do you also see that as a trend in this uh, renewable energy sector? I think so. I think so. I think for certainly, for example, people like us are increasingly going to be looking at opportunities that we can actually create incubators and potentially help um, new companies to scale up. So we'll definitely be looking at that. And I'm sure that as we do it, other people will do it as well. Okay. So that's great news for the startups. Thanks, Suman. I'll now request a handover to Jaydeep uh, for, uh, you know, to take the discussion forward. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Suman, sir. Uh, your, uh, you know, your answers have really been insightful and clearly shows the expertise that you have in the domain as well. So uh, now that you have also uh, spent a significant of, amount of time in this sector and you've also authored a, a book, uh, Fossil Free, uh, on reimagining clean energy in a carbon-constrained world, which is about the past, uh, present and future of the world's energy systems in the context of world-changing climate. So. Uh, what do you think that uh, students should think about the sustainability agenda, uh, given that uh, this is the future and this is ha this has a direct impact on us? Yeah, so you know, uh, that's a great question, by the way, Jadeep. And and please don't call me sir. Um, you know, that's something that I tell all our all our people as well in our company, uh, because among other things, I don't want to foster a hierarchical culture. I want everybody to be ideas focused and, and so on. Um, so look, the whole issue of climate change will actually impact your generation much more than it will impact our generation. Okay. Uh, and therefore, in a way, um, you know, we've also, we've kind of, our generation has let you guys down in that we've not done enough, but also at least you started doing something. But fundamentally, I think it's young people like you all that need to take this whole thing to a whole different level. And uh, we'll pass on to you a flawed effort on our part. You guys will have to take it, perfect it, and uh, make sure that it reach the, reaches the right end outcome, which means that you guys have to be much more focused on the whole area of climate than our generation has been and not make the same mistakes. Okay, so therefore, you guys should really put, be putting pressure on your employers. You should be making personal choices and career choices, which are based around climate change. 
And uh, for example, if you're an investor, if you go into the financial investing world, then certainly you should be investing in companies that are strong on sustainability. If you're working for a corporate and if they have a sustainability agenda, you should think about joining that sustainability agenda in addition to whatever you're doing and push that agenda. In town halls, if you have with your CEOs, you should ask them about what is my company's sustainability agenda. Uh, you should make choices about joining companies that are much more sustainability focused. You should be voting in politicians that at least say something about the environment, right? Rather than just let it carry on. So I think uh, you should, of course, on a personal basis, be buying electric vehicles, uh, you know, switching off lights, you know, doing things on a personal basis, which also save uh, the environment to whatever extent you can. So I think so both in personal choices, professional choices, political, social choices, you have to have, you know, this coming through very, very strongly. Uh, yes, Suman, thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, we've definitely seen that uh, the renewable, the entire concept of renewable energy is no more just a textbook chapter. We've also seen it incorporated into our uh, courses at IMC as well as uh, the different projects that, that we have undertaken. So uh, definitely that we would want to, uh, you know, continue uh, putting our efforts for uh, taking initiative in this direction. So thanks a lot for your answer as well. Uh, now, uh, we also wanted to know that uh, you are an IMC alumni. So uh, if you can share some more about your journey when you were a student at IMC, how was your life at the campus? My life at the campus was so many decades ago that I scarce remember it. No, but let me let me answer your question more seriously. Uh, you know, I uh, I joined I am Calcutta in eighty seven, uh, probably before most of you people were born. I, I'm no, I'm sure before most most of you were born, or all of you were born. Um, and um, uh, you know, I I had come from IIT Delhi, and uh, you know, I found that uh, I am Calcutta was a much shorter time period. One was there for only two years, and um, there were, of course, people were, unlike IIT, people were much more focused on studies. In IIT, you had all sorts of people. Some were focused on studies, some were not. But in IIM Calcutta, people knew that this was their last professional you know, degree, and therefore they'd better do well. So the level of competitiveness was a lot higher in IIM Calcutta um, than uh, had been the case in the undergrad that I had done. Um, but I enjoyed my time there. I think I learned a lot. Um, I, I didn't enjoy the fact that I am Calcutta was so far away from the city and therefore going to the city was not that easy. And the connectivity at that time was not great. You had this Barosi bus, which was which was kind of a very crowded bus all the time, or you had the Joker bandstand. So getting to the city wasn't that straightforward. So that was, uh, that was a difficult thing. But other than that, I think I learned a lot and I had a reasonably good time uh, in, in uh, being there. Um, and then, of course, I think I, I, I was lucky in that uh, I got the job uh, or the jobs of my choice from campus. And uh, so all in all, I had a good, I had a good experience there. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So I think uh, that brings us towards the end of this extremely enriching interview. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sina. Um, you know, I think we covered a wide range of topics today, right? And I was just creating a quick note, building a new company to instilling your own value systems and what you believe in your own, own ethical constructs into your company, um, developing a strong organization and not just thinking about small parts, but the larger picture and most importantly, sustainability. I think towards the end, what you came up to was the fact that, you know, the greatest threat is if we think someone else will solve the climate change problem or it's someone else's business to think about sustainability. I don't think we live in a world like that anymore. And we all have to be equally conscious towards this agenda. Um, your journey, your experiences, have been extremely inspiring. And I think, uh, you know, there'll be much more many readers after this uh, interview for your book, because I am very intrigued to read more about, you know, what you think about this and how you've reached where you've reached, uh, just listening to your journey, you know, today. So 
Thank you so much for talking to us so candidly about the risks you've taken and the returns you've reaped. Uh, we wish you all the best. We wish Renew Power all the best. And on behalf of I am CEI, I am CIP, and also the ESL, uh, we are full of gratitude uh, for the time that you have given us today. Thank you. Well, thank you all of you, Aditi, Shubhranshu, and Jadeep. It was wonderful talking to all of you, and I wish you all the best. Um, entrepreneurship is, in fact, very, very critical, and I wish that more students from I am Calcutta choose that as a career straight out of the institute uh, rather than going to jobs, because I think we need more entrepreneurs in our system. More power to that thought. And on that note, thank you, everyone. And we will see you with the next video. Thank you.